And we are back for another episode of TEDx Dupree Park TV. I'm so glad that you guys are out there today. Please let me know where you're coming in from. I know we have people who are supporting TEDx Dupree Park from around the world. And we have speakers from all over the place. And we have fans from all over. So please just let us know that you're out there. Just say, hi, Gina. We're here coming in from wherever you're coming in from. I'm coming in from sunny Orlando today. It's definitely a chamber of commerce kind of day, nice and breezy, a bunch of white, gorgeous, fluffy clouds in the sky. So it's a beautiful day here. And I know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, a lot of pain, suffering, agony. And that's why we're here, because we know that the folks in our community have a lot of light to share, a lot of goodness to bring into the world. And that's what we want to do. So we're going to talk about a lot of important issues today. And we are excited to bring our guests on to interact with you and to share with you. So by interacting, comment, because when you comment, I can often feature your, your comment right below here. Let me just see if there's one I can feature right now. Uh, hi, everyone. Dream Post TV. Jack Winch of Dream Post TV is going to be with us later today. He's one of our sponsors, which is how TEDx Dupree Park is making ends meet because we need sponsors. So you're going to learn a lot from him and hear from him. So yes, yes, yes. Lots happening in our world this week. Join the conversation. With that, let me bring on our organizer, organizer in chief, the amazing, the amazing Steve Monahan. Steve, come on board here. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Good, you good, started good. off with amazing. I know, I know. You need a new one. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, we have this thing. I'm trying to find new words besides amazing. So tell me what a word you would use instead of amazing in the comments. That would be great. But Steve, what's going on in your world today? Um, I tell you what, my goodness, there's just so much going on. It has really tried. It's hard to keep your head on straight. Uh, and it's hard. You, I... I'm naturally positive and boy, I have to work at it because you can get so sucked into the terrible things that are going. I mean, the, the, just the way the people uh, are commenting, they, you know, to me, it's like they're talking about the, the riding or that. And it's like, why aren't you talking about a man who died? Why are you distracting? Well, it's about a man who died. That's what this is. It's terrible. Um, I tell you what, uh, let me say it this way. When I was a kid, I lived in uh, Newark, New Jersey, which actually in 1967 had uh, probably one of the first and largest, uh, we, they called it back then a riot. 26 uh, people were killed, uh, all black except one white uh, fireman. And, you know, and I've just seen it through my whole life. This, this, this has to end. Um, but when I was a kid, Newark was the biggest city in New Jersey. There was a cathedral near us. There were three or four churches. And so on a regular basis, I would hear the bells ringing. And I, I remember asking my mother, why are the bells ringing? And she said, well, it was for a funeral. And I said, well, they're dead. They can't hear them. And she said, and it kind of woke me up then. She said, the bells are not for them. The bells are for us. The bells are ringing for us to wake us up that we are still alive and we've got life in us and to be happy for it. And the bells are ringing to wake us up of what's going on and we have to fix it. And if we are alive, we're hearing it. Unless our soul is dead, we're not hearing it. And I'm just asking people, you've got to hear the bells. They're ringing. They're ringing loud and very clear for us. You know, we live in one biosphere. And we actually don't live in the biosphere. We are the biosphere biosphere. When the Amazon forest was burned, it depleted us. When there was the fires in Australia, it depleted us. When the waters are polluted, it hurts us. 
when one man dies, we are all diminished as a people. All of us are diminished because we are all connected. And I, on a positive note, I'd like to say this, and I see the positive in it. You know, we're always talking about one person can change the world, and that sounds fairy nary or whatever. But the truth is one person can change the world. There was one man in Wuhan, China, and he ate a live species. He brought panic to the world. People emptied the streets in fear of a terrible future. There was one man in Minneapolis who was killed. And the people filled the streets in hope for a better future. Two men changed the world within just weeks of each other. So we have to remember each of us is connected to one another. What we do to one, we do to the other. We have to wake up to that. Until we wake up, the bells are going to keep tolling and tolling. And, and we got to hear. So I don't know, is that good news or bad news, but it's truth. Well, that's beautifully said, Steve. Thank you so much. And you know, I was delighted that uh, we're able to be joined today by someone who has a very powerful voice. And I know our listeners will want to hear from her. She is the Miss Tracy Brown. Tracy, come on board. How are you doing today? Hey, Gina. Hey, Steve. Hey, everybody out hey, there. Tracy. Well, Tracy has been a powerful voice within the National Speakers Association, which is where I know her from, and many of uh, many wonderful people. And she's risen to my attention again recently because she has this website called What is Mine to Do and a Facebook group about what is mine to do. And it just, uh, Jana Stanfield, our mutual friend, uh, suggested that I talk with you. And so, Tracy, tell us what's on your heart today. What can you share with us to, to help people today? So, Steve, that was a beautiful commentary because what is happening in the world right now is both scary and exciting. We have an opportunity because of the pandemic and because of all of the things that have been happening that are race-based or racially incited to choose what kind of future do we want to have? What kind of world do we really want to live in? So everybody involved with what is mine to do is every day asking the question, what is mine to do to respond or eliminate race-based hatred and violence? So that's where we're going and um, that's what we're talking about. And I think a lot of people want to know what they can do. You know, what is it, what are real things they can do? And that's what happens at the, in the Facebook group. So Steve, I'm having a little difficulty with my camera. I'm so glad uh, I have a wonderful co-host here. So Steve, carry on, yeah, uh, I'll be back. Tracy. I've seen this for so long and, and you're in the thick of it and I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, what gives you hope that something's really going to click? Oh, that is so easy. And it's, I'm not necessarily an optimistic person. I'm just kind of a realist and I'm always looking for what's going on in the world. So it's no accident that five years ago when nine black folks were killed at, in Charleston, South Carolina, there was this big surge of people saying, that's unacceptable, we have to do more, enough is enough. 
and there was a really big spike in people wanting to get involved. That's what's happening now. In the last 10 days, almost every group that I know that is addressing race-based hatred and violence has seen an uptick, some doubling in size in less than a week because people are saying, this has always been a problem, but we have to stop this. We have to stop the race baiting. We have to stop the assumptions and the stereotypes. And I will just add one other thing. I believe because we are at this point in the pandemic, that people also saw that the disparities in the number of people who were diagnosed with COVID-19 reflected long-term trends in access to healthcare or healthcare outcomes. And that on top of people, a couple of really high profile murders three weeks ago and other incidents yeah. in the last two weeks that when George Floyd was killed, then it's like, I can fill my cup and then eventually it's going to overflow. What are some things that you feel people need to be doing right now? I think everybody needs to get involved in some way to talk about and to understand what the dynamic is. Because while George Floyd may be the, the, the trigger that, you know, the straw that broke the camera's, camel's back, it's just a symptom of a lot of things. And the biggest thing that happens in what is mine to do in the group is that many, many people say, well, I'm not made out to be an, a political activist. I'm not one to go and march. I'm not one to go and protest, but I have to be able to do something. So I do believe that everybody can do something with the people they know, the people they come into contact with wherever they go and whatever they are doing. So really learning to understand and really listening to understand. Um, we have a habit of listening to see if people agree with us. But right. really, we need to be listening right now to understand the other people's stories and experiences. Right. I wrote a piece on listening, how important it was. I and mean, compassionate listening, you know, really listening. You know, you're a speaker, so you, you know the old line, we've got uh, two ears and one mouth because we're supposed to be listening twice as much as talking. And But that is so necessary. But I, I don't know. I, I really feel because of the combination of the COVID, because of the political things going on, and because of these murders so many in a row, um, and the last one with George was, uh, it's going to sound strange. It was like God went out of his way to demonstrate what this looks like. And for almost nine minutes, people see that. You can't escape this one. You can't say he was running from me or he was running towards me or this or that. It is just, it makes no sense. The person was just murdered. If people can't wake up on that one, and I think that's what it is. The man sacrificed his life to final, for people to see that made such um, an impression. You cannot ignore that one. Yeah, and I do agree with you that it was so vivid and it is like it was in a series of events that created the perfect storm. And yeah. so now what people really need to do is not turn away, like not go back to sleep and to hold all, everyone to a higher standard. So one of the most terrible things that have come out of this, I you know, there's been a whole hashtag George Floyd uh, challenge where people are recreating the scene as a joke and as viral video, like, you know, one person laying down and someone else putting their knee on them and they're laughing about it. And I just can't even imagine 
how someone could do that. And it's become viral. So, and then everybody else, not everybody else, but so many other people are on the other end. They're saying, I don't want to be silent anymore. So in fact, we're, I'm, we're getting ready to roll out a whole series of things just called break the silence. How do you break the silence? How do you talk about racism? How do you talk about the future we want? How do we talk about creating mutual respect and ending this pattern? Right. 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 Well, I knew that you would be able to shed some light on this, Tracy, and, and to help us all. And um, I did have some technical difficulty there. Were you able to give some advice to people about um, how they should handle criticism when they're posting on Facebook? I, I've seen people posting and I give people the benefit of the, bit of the doubt. I assume they're doing their best what they know to do at the time. And, and then people say, well, you're not doing enough or you should have said more, or, you should have said it sooner, or, you should have done. What do you recommend to people that are kind of frozen right now and they don't wanna do anything because they don't wanna upset the apple cart and be exposed to all this criticism? How, how can we deal with this? So the first thing I would say is that the apple cart has already be, been overturned. So don't worry about upsetting the apple cart. Number two, it is because you are silent that these things can continue, these kinds of incidences can continue. And, and there are people with different opinions. So stay focused on the issue, not the individual. So when you start attacking an individual or saying, I don't agree with you or you're wrong and I'm right, we need an infinite number of approaches. There is no one right answer to resolve this. So if you do post something and people don't agree with it, don't get all wrapped up in arguing about that. Ask them, well, what do you think and why? The key here is learning about as many different perspectives as you possibly can so that you can then speak up when it's appropriate. And finally, talk to the people who are in front of you. Talk to the people who are in front of you. Just ask them, how are they feeling about this? What do they want to do next? What kind of world do they want to live in? There are some people who want to live in a world where there is no diversity based on race or many other categories. I don't believe they are the majority, at least not in the United States of America. And so we have to be able to envision the world that we want and then not give in to any other perspective. Well, so that's, that's what I would suggest. Well, thank you. I think I think that's very well said. So I know there are so many people that, that want to say something, that want to speak up and that want to share and to be part of the making things better because at least the people in my world for the most part they're loving wonderful people and they would never do anything to hurt another and to think less of another and i um, i'm just grateful that um, i was brought up to treat people right and to not judge people by the color of their skin or really pretty much anything else i I fortunately uh, have had a lot of experiences in reading and training and, you know, just always give people the benefit of the doubt and assume everybody's brilliant and that they have a gift inside them and that they are all wonderful people. You do, maybe I haven't figured out how they're wonderful yet, but don't, don't you kind of have that a feeling as well, Tracy? Yeah, to begin with the assumption that everyone has a bit of genius within them and mm -hmm. that they are doing the best that they can. But we have to be honest that we don't live in a society where that is always the norm. And so if people want to be able to talk about it and they just don't even know where to start, then of course I'm gonna say, come check us out and play with us at What Is Mine To Do, the Facebook group. And, you know, or read a book, right? There are so many lists of books and other resources. So there is no excuse anymore that you can't learn about what's going on or how to navigate what's going on. 
Well, very well Bye. said. So guys, guys um, join Tracy Brown. Look her up. She's a powerful professional speaker. If you need a speaker for your events as well, she's doing so many things in um, to, just to make the world a better place. And I particularly love what you are doing, Tracy, at whatismindtodo.com. You guys go look over there. Uh, there's a Facebook group that's associated with this. So you can find that. And uh, with that, Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to being in touch further. Thanks, Gina. Let's stop the silence. Break it. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. All righty. Well, this is where life gets difficult sometimes. You know, you want, you're want you sad. We're sad and we're upset. And life does go on for some of us, fortunately. And I'm a very optimistic, happy person. It's hard for me to stay down. It's hard for me to not share happiness and optimism. You and I were both in the Optimist Club yeah. uh, together for so many years. And I know that that's something that we deal with too. But we do have a number more guests to bring on. Is there anything you'd like to share before we bring on our next guest? No, I'm glad you brought her on. And it's, I mean, that's the only choice we have is do we want to be part of the problem, part of the solution? And, you know, so many of these things just sound easy, but you just have to get up. I mean, every morning I get up and I'm tired or whatever, but I, I go through that and I set an intent. What do I want my day to look like? Because I know what things are going to happen, but most of it is if I can't control, at least I can control how I react to it. So I don't want to be pushed around by life. I, I want to participate in it. Exactly. Very good. I think, uh, let's see what uh, so, um, our producer, Marcy, behind the scenes has featured the, the URL to Tracy's group. So excellent. Okay. Well, from the darkness, there is sunshine. I love the song. The sun will come tomorrow. And with that, let's bring on our next guest. The, when I saw her name, I said, oh, I just love her name. And then the more I've gotten to know her, the more I just adore her. Sunny. Sunny Lane Myers, who is one of our coaches in the TEDx Dupree Park community. Thank you for joining us, Sunny. Oh, you're muted. Let's get unmuted. Let's see if I can unmute you. Give it a try now. Okay. How about now? We can hear you now. Okay, Excellent. good. It's such a treat to join you. Thank you so much. And you know what's so interesting? You mentioned the Optimist Club. My very first public speaking experience was an optimist club speaking contest in fifth grade and uh -huh. it i could honestly say it changed the trajectory of my life because i felt like i was someone who didn't have a voice and all of a sudden i did and i actually in my little fifth grade uh competition i won and i i was like oh my goodness maybe i can do this maybe i have something to share and uh anyway so thank you Optimist Club members everywhere. Well, how fantastic is that? That's so yeah. great. Well, Steve, you know, all those years that we, you know, worked to put on those contests at the different schools and we're like, did it ever matter? Yeah. Did anybody ever do anything with it? Well, now we know at least one did. Oh. So we have our, we have our one starfish. It made a difference to that <laughs> one. <laughs> Absolutely. I did it fifth grade and sixth grade. And yes, it was, it was um, very empowering and it, it did, it did change my life. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for volunteering to be one of our coaches. And so just to let you guys know that if you're not immersed in our TEDx Dupree Park world right now or TEDx at all, TEDx coach speakers, guess what? When they get up on their, they're on the stage and you see their videos, they have prepared, they have rehearsed, they have done so much work. And many times, most of the time, they're working with a volunteer coach. And that's what Sunny is doing. And Sunny is coach to our speakers wonderful speaker, Lynn Sherwood Humphreys, who was on here with us last week on TEDx Dupree Park TV. So you can look on our Facebook page to find that particular video. Uh, Lynn was very moving. And I'm so glad you guys hit it off well together. What have you enjoyed about working with, with uh, Lynn? Well, I almost feel selfish in coaching her because I, I would want to hang out with her as a friend. I would love 
her to be my friend and just talk for hours. So um, in that way, I it's really a gift to be with her. Um, and for those of you who don't know, just really quick, uh, she had a daughter uh, in her early 20s get diagnosed with a, a deadly form of lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, and she was gone within about five months of being diagnosed. And through that, Lynn, who also is so full of light, I, I just feel like she's this giant floodlight walking around. Uh, but she has been able to learn how important it is to have a plan about end of life. And that's a subject that a lot of people don't want to even think about, let alone talk about and take action on. But she has such a wonderful sense of humor even and uh, a, a wonderful light about her. And it makes it feel safe and important to talk about. Uh, so, so family members and loved ones won't have to have that extra stress uh, to know what your wishes are should something happen. And something eventually, what, I mean, we all have this <laughs> the same future sooner or later, right? So I heard someone say, life is tough. No one gets out alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I, Lynn has rubbed off on me. She has a great sense of humor. So I, I hope that doesn't offend anyone. Well, she certainly does have a great sense of humor. She and does. that that's such a wonderful description of her that she's walking around. She's like this beacon of light. I She's just one of those people. The very first time I saw her, I like, she just looks so friendly and nice. I want to get to know her better. Absolutely. Steve, I know you enjoyed meeting Lynn last week. Yeah, she's really nice. And you're right, she does have a sense of humor. Her book is... Um, oh, L Lynn, put it in the comments. Yeah. I don't remember either. What it was a very clever name. Crap, crap out, cratch out. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> it's something about a frog. What a croak? Yeah, it has a picture oh, of it. Oh, your croak file. Your yeah, croak, croak file. file. Sorry, yeah. my mind went blank for a second there. Yeah, but it's yes. kind of my death file. It's my crow file. I it's mean, your crow you know, file. that breaks the ice a little bit, and then people talk about it. And we do need to talk about it. We um, absolutely do. And my mother, uh, I lost my mom in 2009, uh, right before my first child was born. And so I know, you know, firsthand what, what that feels like. And so, yes, I think one of the greatest gifts uh, that Lynn is sharing with people that one of the greatest gifts we can all give our loved ones is our plan for end of life. And the, the great thing about it all is once we do that, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about it. You can just live life. Yeah. It's kind of like your homework is done. Now you can go yeah. play outside. Now you can go play. Exactly. Well, Sunny, um, Tell us a little bit about your you as well. I know that you're doing, you know, Lynn's just saying such wonderful things about you. And oh, so you're a speaker yourself great. and you do coaching and what, what, kind of, yes. what kind of things do you do? Well, I started out as a broadcast journalist. So I started out as a, they call it a one man band uh, in Des Moines, Iowa in 2005. That's, uh, you know, uh, politics central, right? Because it's the first in the nation caucus. So I was carrying my big old tripod and my big camera. They weren't cool and sleek and chic yet. And, and uh, trying to look decent on the 5 p.m. news, having sweated all day long in that Midwestern uh, humidity and heat. Um, anyway, but that was a wonderful experience. I covered everyone from Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, before he became anything political, Joe Biden, you name it. Uh, I, I covered them uh, and interviewed many of them personally. That was great. And then I became a morning anchor in the Eastern corridor of Iowa. If you've heard of Cedar Rapids, Iowa City. So that meant I'm up at 2.30 or 3 in the morning for four and a half years, um, you know, putting, putting my makeup on, trying to stay awake. I tell you, if they had lash extensions back then, I would have been their best customer because you need 
fake eyelashes to wake you up in the morning or else it looks like, oh, it looks like you're, you're asleep. You're a complete zombie. Anyway, so fake eyelashes every day. I know these things sound so frivolous and in the long term they are, but audience, audiences will let you know if, if they, if, if you need to change your lipstick color, your hair, your anything. Um, yeah, before internet trolls were a thing, we definitely got that from viewer <laughs> email. Never mind about politics. Your hair looks awful today, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. Anyway, so I did that for four and a half years and I was I worked really hard. I loved it. I was blessed to uh, earn an Emmy Award for anchoring and an Emmy nomination for one of my stories. And then I also reported in Seattle, Washington and covered news up there in the great Northwest. I took a break. I, frankly speaking, um, waking up that early and having young children for years, it took a toll on my health. And I just really knew it was going to go south soon. So I needed to take a break. And um, so I have two lovely children. And I always knew I would return somehow to speaking and broadcasting. I wasn't sure what it was going to look like, but I, I tell you this, speaking to schools or any a public audience in person was by far my most favorite part of my job, which was a little bit surprising to me. And I think one of the reasons was as a journalist, by definition, you need to be unbiased. You know, you need to be, um, an observer and a sharer, and you just have to really be careful, right? <laughs> About um, not not getting too personal, but um, and and so I felt like I was on the sidelines. But when you're a speaker, and that's why I just adore TED talks. I I, I am such a TEDx junkie. I have listened to hundreds of talks by now. Um, I just realized that when you have the privilege of speaking to people, you can really help change their lives. And as Steve was saying earlier, um, one person really can change. If, if we think about Martin Luther King's speech or uh, other famous speeches, they resonate through the ages. So that old that saying about the pen is mightier than the sword i absolutely believe that i am so passionate about the power of public speaking and connecting with people i can remember different speeches where i just felt something change in my heart and i was like i need to do better at that or i want to do that or i can do that and uh, it really did help change the trajectory of my life and so it's thrilling to be able to coach someone who is doing that for other people. Wonderful. Well, we just so appreciate what you're doing. Sunny, if folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them, them to do that? Right now, the best way is my Facebook group. You get awesome speaking tips for free. It's Own Your Spotlight Speaking. Own Your Spotlight Speaking is my Facebook group. And there's already some great resources there right now. Videos, but you don't have to watch videos. Also, just you can just glance through and I guarantee it will help you be a better speaker. Excellent. Well, that's so good. Oh, well, I imagine yeah. you, oh, something else. Oh, yes, and, and sorry, Lynn had I just wanted here. to say something. Right now in, in the climate where there is so much heartache um, and I grew up partly in Minnesota and so, Oh my goodness, you know, seeing my home state and what happened there is, is so uh, tragic. I'm remembering a quote that I heard. Uh, I think most of the people listening to this either are speakers or will have the chance to speak to an audience. Um, and I remember this quote Hope is the great religion of all humankind. Hope is the great religion of all humankind. And I think. Whatever subject we're speaking on, whether it's mathematics or AI or education, I do believe that our audience is always looking for some hope. And so I always try to uh, 
teach that to whoever I coach. Always end with hope. Mm, that's excellent. And I'm sure as a journalist, as you were out in the field and covering things that probably were often very upsetting, mm. you had to walk that line. Absolutely. And it was really tough at first. And then you, you figure out, okay, how can I survive this? Keep my humanity and my sanity. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, I mean, every job has its challenges, right? And that's one for, for journalism, for sure. Well, thank you so much. Well, as you go, I do want to feature another post here from Lynn Sherwood Humphreys, one of our speakers that we're so excited will be joining us on our TEDx Dupree Park stage on November 20th in Woodstock, Georgia at the Mad Life Stages and Studios. And so Lynn says, I get to work with you, your breadth and depth of experience is impressive and your passion for people shines through. I'm so thankful that you are on my path, Sunny Lane Myers. Aww. Yay! <laughs> that made my week. Thank oh, you, Lynn. doesn't it? Yeah, so wonderful. Well, Sunny, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being part of our TEDx Dupree Park family. And even though things were delayed a little bit, it's just going to give our speakers more time to be even better once they get That's on our right. stage, right? Absol absolutely. Let's look at this as a plus. Thank you, Sunny. Take thank care. Thank you. Take care, Sunny. Thanks for being a part of this team. Oh boy. Well, we just have such magnificent people on our team and you guys can find out all about them by going over to tedxdupreepark.com and you can see our speakers and our merchandise. Steve has organized a whole bunch of cool t-shirts and coffee mugs and journals and all kinds of things for you, for your pets, for your babies. It's really wonderful that you can get all kinds of TEDx Dupree Park swag. I've got to get that word right. Swag for right. yourself yeah. and your friends and your and your furry friends. And so uh, and you can find out about sponsorship opportunities. We're going to be introducing you to one of our sponsors in just a few minutes. Uh, but we um, we need sponsors. And that's what makes the world go round in many ways. Mm -hmm. The money is the lubricant, right? It's the energy that helps keep things flowing and keeps food and advertising and all those kind of things that are going to be necessary to have a fantastic TEDx Dupree Park TV and TEDx Dupree Park event as well. Yeah. So with that, Steve, let's bring on our next speaker. I know he has a special place in your heart as well as mine for many reasons, including which we had coffee together. We had a mastermind together for years and years, and we yeah. probably drank coffee together more than anyone else I've had coffee with uh, of the three of us. So let's bring on one of our speakers. If I can push the right button, I've had to change systems here today and it's a little frustrating. Hang on, hang on. It's going to work. Uh, there work. we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Joe Gandolfo. How you doing? Great. I'm well. I'm super good. How are you guys? Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> we did drink a lot of coffee years ago. We sure did. We sure did. Yeah. Joe and I go, you know, I just got to tell a couple things here because he had such an impact on my life. Number one, he introduced me to National Speakers Association many years ago, which has, I used to joke, and it's really true that most every good thing in my life, most every good thing in my life has come about through something associated with TEDx, with, uh, with NSA, National Speakers Association. So I have such wonderful friends and essentially an extended family there. So thank you, Joe, for encouraging me to oh, attend that national conference in Atlanta, Georgia in 2005. You're yeah. You're welcome. And um, I was just you and baby, I had- I was just a baby in it too. I was a little puppy in the organization. So. Yes, and you rose to uh, such leadership ranks, leading the youth program there. Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. And you and I started the Cherokee Toastmasters group, which many people in our audience and many people in our TEDx community yeah. are members of, including Steve has been part of that over time also. Yeah. I think, Steve, you were there in the very early days, weren't you? Yeah, I think I went to the third meeting. I had no, I had no idea what it was about and asked if I would step up and say a few words and probably like usual, instead of a few, I had a whole lot more, but it was, <laughs> It was exhilarating. It was fun. Yeah, it was a cool thing. For Woodstock, yeah. Georgia, it was kind of quiet then. It's it's a much more bustling area, but that was uh, really something lively then. Yeah, one of the one of the really super cool and humbling things for me is 
occasionally I will, you know, see some marketing or hear somebody talking about it. And I believe like over 800 people have gone through. Oh, so wow. it wasn't ever about us, but that's just really cool that it rooted, it grew, yeah. it served that many people over the years and continues to uh, be there for people. Uh, so yeah. yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome. There are, they're all fearless people because, you know, it's, uh, I think they've said, you know, people, they've done surveys and people would rather die than have to get up and speak in front of people. Yeah. yeah. So, and, but they wanted to do it mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they pushed through it and to watch them grow over a nine month period, um, was, you know, just inspiring. Beautiful. It's beautiful. In nature, you know, there is that seeds of greatness in each of us there is that <laughs> genius in each and it just needs to be pulled out we have to get through the um the brainwashing of our early years and and uh, start feeling who we are and building upon that yeah well speaking of that joe i know you're really excited about sharing oh. what your your thoughts of seeds of greatness with us on the tedx stage on november 20th i'm going to pull Steve and myself back into this uh, off studio and let you tell folks just a little bit about what you'll be talking about there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So welcome everybody. Um, first and foremost, I am so honored to have this opportunity to present at the TEDx, the inaugural TEDx in downtown Woodstock. Um, it, it, it's, it's just amazing energy. Yeah, there's, it's amazing energy going on up here in this little town and to be a part of it and to meet the other speakers at a few of the events before we got locked down with the corona. Um, all you that are watching and will be watching, you all are in for a special treat here at this event in November. Um, my, my title of the, of the talk is called The Art and Science of Loving Yourself. And actually it was not the first topic I proposed, uh, but come to learn the first one would not take. And so I threw this other one at the organizers and it was based on um, my professional life as well as personal life. And the impetus, I guess, in a lot of ways for this for me was my um, falling in to practicing yoga and falling in love with practicing yoga uh, not quite three years ago. Um, for those of you who practice yoga, it's, it's a place of self-discovery, very simply. But the talk isn't about yoga. It's about the art and science of loving yourself. So professionally, I am a licensed counselor, executive life coach, speaker, author, and really what that has afforded me over the course of clo close to three decades of work is thousands upon tens of thousands of face-to-face -face conversations with human beings. Uh, from ages uh, seven, eight years old, all the way up to a full life, 70s, 80s, um, whether it's been youth, inner city youth, parents, educators, therapists. Um, I have university taught, so college students. I've worked with collegiate student athletes, professional athletes, corporations, uh, fathers, mothers. So um, over the course of all these countless conversations, uh, and privileged conversations, uh, I have discovered some things, I guess you could say, along the way about us humans, about humanity, about the human condition uh, that we all go through. And, and not to get into the whole notion of the human condition, but on one side of the coin, the human condition is all the same for all of us. On the other side of the coin, it is completely unique to all of us. So over the course of my career, through talking to pe people, very intimate, very privileged, very real conversations, what I began, what began to hit me about five to ten years ago, was, and, and I didn't have my head around it really at time, but it was just a notion of people being able to love themselves. It really started to jump out at me that human beings had difficulty loving themselves. I wasn't clear on it at the time. So over the course of these last five to 10 years, it started coming up more. And then I started asking just a couple simple questions. 
I had no idea where this was going at the time. I didn't even know it was going anywhere at the time. And the simple questions were this of my clients. What does it mean to care for yourself? How do you care for yourself? What does it mean to love yourself? How do you love yourself? And the answer that I was getting back from 98, 99% of the people I was working with, no matter what age they were, at that time was nobody's ever asked me these questions before. And when I began to get that answer over and over and over, I was thinking, there's something going on here. Why has nobody asked other humans these questions before? So let's fast forward to last fall. And I started shooting video again for my work. And it was November. I started talking about gratitude. Then I started talking about kindness in mid-November. And then I took a risk at the end of November and I shared what I just shared with you, kind of like insights for, be, from behind my door in my office. And I shared this little thing about asking people about what does it mean to care for yourself? What does it mean to love yourself? I started talking about self-love on the videos and my life went haywire in a wonderful way, in the most beautiful way, professionally and personally. Um, that speaks to the power, I think, of love and self-love. And so not to give away the speech by any stretch of the imagination, and it's still a work in progress. And the backdrop, you all, and you know this, the backdrop of life right now for all of us and all of us presenters as we lead into this event is different than it was three months ago when we were in Mad Life Studios in February at that wonderful event. The backdrop of life has changed. Um, and so the the notion of the questions of what does it mean to care for yourself and what does it mean to love yourself is um, I do not believe people really know what it means to truly and deeply love themselves and fall in love with themselves. And I'm going to say it right here to you all. We have the notion of self-care down. We know how to do that. So whatever the self-care things are, we know what they are. And to a lesser or greater degree, we do them. But self-care is one component of self-love. But the more I dig into this, the more I talk with human beings. And again, I've got the vantage point of, you know, private conversations uh, and talking real stuff with people as they go through their life and go through their struggles with their family, with themselves and their work, their whole life and, and working to get out of that in ways. And so there is an art to loving yourself, but there's also some really cool science around when we get into like self-compassion and gratitude and kindness in the heart brain stuff. There is deep science in terms of it changing brain matter, impulses to the heart and all that. So I'm gonna leave you all with that in terms of what the talk's about, a little bit how it emerged over these years. And um, I guess it's my time to deliver it to the world based on all my personal experience along with my professional. So I am just blessed and honored to uh, have this opportunity because there were over a couple hundred people who wanted to share their ideas and their heart with the world. And to be chosen and this topic um, is one of the most humbling things that has happened to me in my entire life, probably top five. So I thank you guys. Thank all the speakers who are joining us, all the helpers, the speech coaches, the production people, the marketing people. You all are doing an amazing job. You guys, the heads of this. And there is a super buzz starting to happen again in the community as it wakes up. So um, thank you. And I look forward to the 20th for sure. Well, thank you, well, so, thank much, you so much, Joe. Yeah. Stay yeah. by. Stay by. I'm hearing some I'm echo, hearing there. echo there. Yeah. yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Uh oh. So, Steve, is there anything else you'd like to ask Joe? No, Joe and I go back the whole time. He's, he's, he's like a trip, not an acid trip. A fun. Trip. <laughs> Sometimes it's been an acid trip, but it's a fun trip. He's just a, I mean, just look at him. I'm, I know him, and I'm sitting here awestruck just listening to you. He has that ability to just pull people right in. Uh, he could be talking about Tootsie Rolls and I'm interested in it. <laughs> uh, he's just a cool guy. So we're so happy to have you. Um, it's, uh, 
you know, you're one of the first persons we wanted. And uh, we're so well, I think I think fun. right now our world is tilled to plant deeper seeds of love within ourselves and to understand that more, to awaken that. So we're truly loving ourselves so we can bring that deeper into the world to others. Right. I believe the last few months have just tilled up the person's inner soil. And right. I am so excited to plant the seeds and I hope the others are because I think the audiences in our world are more tilled up right now to use a farmer's analogy right. uh, than they were three months ago when we had that event at yeah. Mad Life. It, it is. It's like we thought this was, oh man, this is tough. What are we going to do? And then it just, you know, the Pollyanna came out of uh, Gene and I and was like, you know, this is going to be something really good because it's like, you know, you got to get hit in the head sometimes. Well, it's like the whole world got hit in the head at the same time. And it's like, okay, I'm listening now. I want to hear what you guys have to say. And um, it's going to really be powerful. It is. Mm -hmm. Good That's words right. are needed, uplifting words. Sure is. Yeah. Yeah, Bobna, who is one of our fantastic people, I call her, I consider her our sponsor shepherd. She's wonderful. She's, she's wonderful. She's just been helping so much in uh, getting the word out about TEDx Dupree Park to the community. And so she's saying healthcare is on the trajectory of mental health crisis with the negatively laced events in last few months. Absolutely. And Joe, I know you've been addressing that. I mean, your whole life has been dedicated to that. And this yoga is sort of a natural outgrowth in many ways it's just another means to help people with their natural health with their mental and health. yoga for me has just become a place of self-discovery on that mat and growth and just a mad falling in love with the practice i don't know why but um there are parallels to living your life that you can take off the mat and use no doubt about that and you know i want to say one last thing here too gina because some things i've seen come across the screen as far as mental health and you know i mentioned I'm, I'm a licensed counselor and life coach i've been in this field for almost three decades and the one thing that i want to say to people is this when people come to search out those kind of services typically kind of the language that's in their mind is that i'm broken or i need fixing or something's wrong with me and i do not believe that about human beings anymore after all these years of doing the work uh, we're living the human condition. It's not easy. It's challenging at times, you know, but that doesn't mean something's wrong with a person, nor are they broken. If there's anything wrong with any of us, we're on this big rock spinning at over a thousand miles an hour on its axis. It's hurtling through space at over 67,000 miles in its orbit. Our, our natural thinking sh should be we should go flying off this thing. We don't because there's some crazy super glue that holds us on called gravity. But the crazy thing about gravity is we can't see, smell, taste, or touch it, but we believe in it. Well, I'm here to tell each and every one of you that's watching this, the same truth holds true for you. There is so much potential, power, amazingness inside of you even so you might not be able to see it, there is no doubt that it's there. And it's time to connect with that, each and every one of us, individually and collectively, and bring that forth into our world for now and for future generations. Ooh, so powerful, Joe. You have always had such great analogies and ways of simplifying things with a simple story. I know that's part of what makes you such a great speaker, but also a great counselor and just a great friend. You've always been so good at helping me see through the the darkness and uh, to clarity as well. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Y'all are doing an amazing job with this. You all, Thank you. everybody is. And I'm blessed but, to be part. Oh, well, we're just so eager for you to be able to share with us and to learn from you further. Steve, any final words for Joe? Namaste, y'all. No. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste, everybody. Divine oh, boy, light. that's a good one. That's a the good divine one. Divine light in me sees and honors the divine light in each and every one of you. Y'all have a blessed day. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. You take Thank care. You. Thanks Thank for sharing with us. Bye. It was just beautiful. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I this is, this is why we work so hard on this. Partially, it's just because we get to be around such wonderful people. And we know that through our speakers and our coaches and our team members and everybody, that we're just getting such goodness out into the world. And I'm, I'm personally delighted that we're now able to do it through this TEDx to Pre Park TV platform, yeah. which we never would have done if it had right. not been for, for the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic crisis. It's, it's really up to creativity level. Um, 
it's, this is fun. Uh, we got to figure a way to just uh, keep moving it up. You know, we've got a lot of talent there. Uh, Emmy Award winners, too. Uh, I think so. Yeah, Ariel and Sonny. Aurea and Sonny. Uh, yes. Aurea. I keep confusing Aurea with Ari. Nestle. Yes, we have an Ari also who's <laughs> also very accomplished. To, you know, anyhow. But uh, there's a lot of talent. It's an amazing amount of talent. Well, speaking of talent and creativity, we're now going to bring on board one of our sponsors that I know you met originally, Steve. So I'm going to bring him on and let you open open this door with our sponsor All here, right. who is Jack Winch of Dream Post Productions. Oh, hey. hello. Hello. How's everyone doing? <laughs> I was just meditating after listening to Joe. Yes. He's so great at just relaxing you, especially since I'm not a speaker. I'm yeah. behind the camera. But go ahead, Steve. You could <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jack and I, he actually reached out to us and wanted to know if he could help us with the video. And we had already kind of locked it in with man life. But I said, I'd love to meet with you. I, I like to meet creative people. So I want to meet with you. And um, we turned where there was nothing there into something. Uh, there was someone that I knew that uh, wanted to write a book. And I, I, he asked me to write it. I didn't want to write it. But he wanted to do a movie. And Jack is involved in that industry. Comes from California. Uh, has done... Academy Awards, Emmy Awards was shooting a, a Netflix series. And here he is in Woodstock. I mean, it's, you know, all these people that it's just amazing have fell into our lap. I think I, the first thing I shared with you, the first person I ever met, our thing is seeding greatness. The first event we have, the first person I meet is a botanist. Then I meet, you know, the cinematographers. I mean, it's just, it's just how everything's come together. But Jack is an extremely nice, compassionate, hardworking person. We're so glad that he's been able to help us. He helped us with our opening streaming. Uh, now he's uh, helping the, one of our speakers perhaps put together a uh, animal welfare series, which I'm really excited about. Um, so with that, uh, Jack, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background so they know who you are. Uh, sure. Thanks, Steve. And, and thanks, Gina, too, for having me. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm not a speaker, but I I was looking, you know, just to prepare for this, Steve. I, I went into my IMDb Pro. I don't go onto it too often, but I just sometimes you go there to check and see what credits they're giving you. And I noticed that my first credit was The New Adventures of Robin Hood. And it wasn't as a production person or anything like that. It was as an actor. Oh. And that was, I was like, wow, 1998, first IMDb credit, actor. Uh, yes, I moved from Seattle to LA to do acting, but I was always dabbling in the production end of things in college, which I started over at Gonzaga University where I got my broadcasting degree. And then my first job was working for a production company called Pinnacle Productions. And they had an office out in Spokane, Washington, and then another in Seattle. They ended up closing the one in Spokane, and I ended up um, actually having to leave that and find something else. And I, I found a job working for an ad agency in a place called Puyallup, Washington. If anyone out there is listening in the state of Washington. And a uh, real great guy there. And uh, that kind of set off my career working in ad agency business. Now, what's interesting is many of our clients were speakers. And what I got to do is travel around with them and basically run these seminars. And, and some of these people that I worked with, I mean, you may be familiar with who they are. One guy, uh, probably know him, Stephen Covey. I, I mean, who knew? Who knows? I mean, little things like that happen in your life, which... Um, I guess when you look at your career, and I've been doing this for about 30 years now, uh, you kind of wonder, how did I, I get here? And back then I was like, okay, I'm working for Stephen Covey, you know, helping him with his commercials. We're doing TV commercials for him. And uh, it was great. 
Uh, but at the same time, I had this dire hunger to be this actor and or in front of the camera. I didn't know what at the time. Um, and so I went to California thinking that was going to be it. But but after getting that series and, and uh, I did some background and some other movies out in California, I started realizing that wasn't my calling. And, and a lot of times when you're in your 20s and you're trying to figure it out, you don't know where you're going to head. So um, so I started trying to really, you know, figure out, try to figure out what is my calling. And I did work for some ad agencies down there, some of the top ones in the world, like Foot Conan Building, J. Walter Thompson. We had accounts like Honda and Toyota and Wells Fargo. And uh, it was great to do, I was a media buyer. And um, that was back in the day when production was, I mean, I shouldn't just say production, I would I'd say advertising was really kind of locked down to the there were the three networks when I was in college ABC NBC CBS I want to talk a little bit about the history I'm not going to go into it too much but basically um, they didn't they didn't have the internet is what I'm trying to say and they didn't have all of these ways that you can actually do everything that you can do now so talking to those people that might be younger who are trying to get off the ground uh, listen this the, the world has opened up to you and these are opportunities which back then you had to work for a big production company to even get anywhere. These days you can start your own production company with what you got. What I did back in 1999 was when I started Dream Post and uh, I just bought an Avid. Okay, I saved up my money. I didn't really have much, but it was still $30,000 and that was a lot to save up. And I, I just happened to get some from the ad agency and I was just really smart about what to do with that. And uh, at that time, I was like, okay, I'm going all in and and did that. And at the time, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I don't know how to edit. I mean, I did it in college, but I'm not a professional. So I hired an editor who showed me and we got clients. And eventually I got clients. Like Steve mentioned, uh, I worked with Academy Awards. I did the in memoriam type uh, edits that you see during the Academy Awards back in the 90s. And then uh, I also had, you know, ended up shooting for uh, the Academy Award, uh, the um, presidential ball and stuff like that. And then uh, that job led to another job, to another. And um, eventually the production company was, was rolling. And uh, since then I've done thousands of shoots, everything, including from, uh, uh, you know, small productions to large productions. One of the ones I really like to talk about is Drug Wars. And that was a, a Fusion Network TV series which my friend, buddy, that I knew from church, and he, I also did another film, short film with him before that, got this opportunity and called me up and said, hey, would you like to be a part of this? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. And, and that was a, a, an exciting time. And that was just two years ago when I did that series. And prior to that, there, there was a documentary. Uh, I, did, uh, I worked on some, an ESPN show that uh, I was producing and, and then – um, it got really huge. ESPN picked it up and, and then that went from there. But anyway, I guess what I, I wanted to mention four things for those out there listening who, who might want to figure out like, well, you know, how do you move to Georgia? Okay. Um, yeah, I started in California. I moved to Georgia three years ago and I love Woodstock. This is an awesome place. And my wife was the one who was kind of you know, saying, Hey, there's this big Georgia film uh, thing going on. Everyone's moving to Georgia. And I was like, huh, it's taking a chance because I have everything set up in or in uh, California. And I've been here for at that time, probably what, 15, 16 years doing it. And, uh, you know, should we do it or not? And I was like, well, California is kind of expensive. It's a nice change. Let's give it a shot. We love the Woodstock area. We moved here. And, uh, and since then, um, it's been the same type of thing, networking. And I wanted to emphasize that um, one of the four things that, that I think are important when starting a business and getting yourself going, um, networking. Um, I wrote them down because, like I said, I'm not a speaker, but I wanted to talk about this real quick uh, because, um, you know, you wonder, well, you know, how does it happen? Well, uh, you have to put yourself out there. And one other thing um, for those younger that are starting out, and I don't know, there, there may be some people in the audience, I know there's a lot of speakers out there, and um, those that are just starting, um, 
become good at your craft. I think that's important and really um, have a passion for that. Have a passion for what you do. And the more passion that you have for what you do, the better it's going to be. And I always saw myself uh, against, not against, but some of my colleagues that are doing in the production business and they would hire me. I'll get hired to be their cinematographer. And I think that's great because that's really where my heart is. And so I put a lot of passion into that, a lot into shooting and becoming really good at the camera and being able to, to do that. And, um, you, know, at the, you know, that's great for the creative end, but what about the business end? And that was something that I needed to work on. And so I, I was like, okay, I have to step out of my shell, even though I used to be an actor, but that was years ago. I need to go and just introduce myself. And that's how I met Steve. And that's how I got involved with this. And I ended up um, helping them with, with the opening uh, uh, two minute, I think two or three minute um, production that you'll see when you go to the event. And uh, I'm also working with uh, one of their speakers, uh, for those, I'll just plug it real quick. It's Dr. Good Unleashed. It's a web series, a YouTube web series, which I just kind of came up with. I was like, okay, you know, um, he's, he always wanted a TV series, Dr. Good, but he never was able to get it going. I was like, well, if we did this, maybe you can get interest to, for a network. And this is just a little bit of creative thinking because, I mean, there's it's not like a big, huge production. It's basically me doing this web series. So, so you can check it out. But my, my whole point on this is to, you know, sometimes you got to get a little creative to get things going. And especially when it comes to business, you might have to change your business model. The coronavirus came up. Oh my gosh. Almost every single one of my shoots, because productions are not going on right now because of this coronavirus, they've been canceled. And, you know, so I've had to get, you know, a little bit of creative, you know, what, what am I going to do to the next step? And, and you don't, you know, one, another thing I have on my list here is, is to not quit and to keep going and, and don't give up on it because things will come along. And, uh, you know, based on enough of the networking that I've done in the past, um, just in the past two weeks, what, what I've been working on, and this could be appreciated by, by uh, your speakers, especially our, our first one today, um, because um, what I've been working on is uh, the, the economy has been closed down, uh, shut down has happened, there's a lockdown. And so across my desk, someone called me up and said, hey, uh, we need um, some help editing these doctor videos and what these doctors are talking about is the coronavirus and you know just how dangerous is it and and the facts and you know that that sort of thing so um you know this will be coming out recently but had i not had that relationship with somebody who i shoot with um which you know hell, i had other things cancel with him he uh, he called me up and said hey Jack, would you mind editing for me i need some help and and so i guess with, with that it just kind of tells you that um if you work on your craft, if you're not afraid to pick up the phone and call someone, because I mean, it's it's hard if you, I mean, a lot of times, you know, they'll see your stuff, which is great, but you do have to market yourself. Um, you have those and then, um, you know, get experience if you don't have experience. And that's um, a lot of times you have to take things for free. I'm not saying all the time, but you have enough paid work to, to get by. I think, you know, sometimes, you know, you can't ever have that little chip on your shoulder. And some people do, and, and that's okay. And um, I, I actually like to help as many people as I can. So the last fourth thing that I had to talk about, I know I skipped around, um, but I didn't mention it yet. And that's get, that's giving back, and that's that's teaching people. And one of the things I like to do also is I like to actually help out the the students out there who are are uh, I volunteered a few times to uh, to some high schools to teach them about the the production business. It's an interesting business. It, it, it there's so many different ways you can go. When it comes to me personally, like if it moves, uh, if I can shoot it with a camera, I'm going to do it because um, that's kind of you know what I love to do working on another documentary uh, uh, that, that will be coming out soon. There's like uh, Steve mentioned, there's, there's one that uh, came out on Netflix. I, I guess I'll give that plug. It it's called a champion heart. I helped out on that. My wife cast that movie. Um, but uh, that's a, a nice little film family film 
about a horse and, and a girl, so a little uh, high school girl. And, um, but, you know, just this is all like, like that was shot on a no budget. A, a champion heart, watch it. I'm telling you, he didn't have a budget. Okay, that was all volunteer. So I just, I just want to you know, tell people, don't give up. You will get paid in what you do, and you deserve to get paid when it's right. But uh, I don't want to get too caught on there. But it's important to make sure you give back too. You know, everything you said, we really need now because people are out of jobs. There's going to be some businesses that won't start back up. And you can't just say, well, that's what I was. And now what am I going to do? I mean, you just took people through four things. You know, have a positive attitude, experiment. That's what entrepreneurs do. They take a risk. Uh, it's a capital risk, but it's a personal risk. You being, you know, you could be embarrassed in front of your family or whatever, but they do it. So you did it anyway. And, you know, you keep trying. You never gave up through the COVID. And the main thing I like, and I see you, just a younger version of me, as a mentor. And that's through your whole thing, is you were trying through your time here on as a sponsor, really helping people how to get a, you know, how to kickstart a career. And that's what we're all about. Small businesses here in Woodstock, helping them out. A lot of them are hurting. Uh, and how to get creative and you just kind of ran them through it. So we're so glad to have you a part of this. And uh, we've got some more things we're gonna be sending your way. Oh, I hope so. You can help us well, out. I, I knew I only had a short time. I tried to fill it in as much as possible. So that's why I talk kind of quick. So watch it again. Hey, hey, those people, that's a good idea. Hey, start from the beginning. A lot of good information. So I thank you guys for having me on it. All well, right. Thank, I'm well, thank you so much for being here, Jack. And I, I'm so excited to hear about the show, the documentary that you're doing with Dr. Good. You guys, you haven't met him through our TEDx Dupree Park TV show yet, but Dr. Good will be on here one day if we can, if we can um, tie him down. He's so busy saving animals. My goodness, this man literally personally is responsible for saving tens of thousands of dogs and cats, which is this whole uh, save the companion animals is a big part of what drew Steve and me together right. to begin with many years ago was our belief that we can end the, the senseless slaughter. It is slaughter of dogs, cats, puppies, and kittens throughout the world, especially the United States, which your tax dollars are mostly paying for folks. Yeah. Let's stand up, up to, and do something about this. And, three and or 4 million per year in shelters. You know, you said it, I think on the last one, wouldn't you, I would like to see the statistics every on the news. One million, two million, three. You know, we're just, you know, it's so powerful to see when you see that. Um, somehow, we, I, I've been trying for 15 years how to figure this out. I've written books, done this, everything, rescued them by hand. Uh, we've just got to figure a way to do it. But I think, I think it is going to, because of the COVID happened, we see what's going on in the slaughterhouses. We now equate that to dogs and cats. We know in China they were eating animals. They finally just this year stopped eating dogs. Things are changing so quickly um, that the vegan movement moving in, the plant-based movement moving in. Uh, so I think a lot of good things are going to come from this. I was going to say, yeah, even uh, the plastic movement, one of the documentary that I'll be working on is about how hemp to replace the use of plastics. Since plastics, the biodegradable of plastics, I mean, they sit around for hundreds of years without decomposing. So hemp, because of the, 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 the type of material, the, the plant is able, you could actually replace plastics with hemp and so that's what that documentary will be about oh, wow. and also i want to say one thing about dr good is yes he is out there he wants to change the world he wants to stop the euthanization of every adoptable homeless pet in america so i'm just gonna i just want to plug that for him because i know that's his passion and you guys were talking about the animals i know uh, steve you have a passion for animals too you have something really great that you told me about right. anyway well thank you wow. Thank you so much, Jack. And just to yeah. hear that you're working with Dr. Good on that and, and that this is uh, something you're an issue you're going to be amplifying and magnifying through 
video through through TV and cable and all these things that you know about that I don't know about. I know about social media and video. Yeah. And in fact, right now I'm uh, hosting a 30 videos in 30 days, make a big impact challenge. And I'm teaching people to use, to your point, I mean, people can use their phones, they can use their cameras, they can use their computers, which is what I'm using right now. Uh, and broadcast the same thing that we could have done 10, 20 years ago that would have cost thousands, multiple thousands of dollars. It was prohibitive to most people. And nowadays people can use their own tools and reach far across the globe if they have a message to share, which our folks in the TEDx Dupree Park community do. So with that, I wish we could keep you on all day, but oh, we're going to let nice. you get back to, to things that are going on with you in Woodstock. And we're so glad that you did move from California and tell your wife, <laughs> give her a big hug and tell her we're so glad that, that she thought that was a good idea because okay, we did too. I'm glad that you're there. Thanks so much, Jack. Thank you, Thank you guys. Great. All right. Thank you. Later. See you. Bye-bye. All right. All right. With that, let's bring on our co-organizer, Mike Cena. Mike, you've been out there watching today, as you have done for each of our episodes. We've had some cool, cool things going on today, haven't we? I tell you, each week is a new adventure in excellence, a new adventure in humanity, a new adventure in the snowball effect that TEDx Dupree Park is having upon the community of Woodstock, Cherokee County, the state of Georgia, and across our country. I um, another terrific episode. I want to parrot uh, Jack just a bit. I love Woodstock. We all love Woodstock. And I want to encourage those local and those listening far away. Think about what it would mean to you to be aligned with TEDx2 Pre Park. Think about how your dollars could help. Think about the difference you can make as an individual. That's one of the things we've talked about throughout all of our episodes is how one person can make a difference. We'd love to have you be a part of us. And we've got a great package. Uh, any of us would be glad to talk to somebody listening, watching us, wanting to know how to get involved. We'll help you get involved. We'll help you seed greatness going forward. Absolutely. Well, what a what a wonderful ending and what a wonderful way to to get that message out, Mike. Thank you. And we are so easy to reach, you guys. You're watching us somewhere on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or maybe even LinkedIn right now. So just Drop us a note. We're pretty easy to find. And let us know that you're interested in learning more about how you could be a sponsor, how you can get tickets. There's a couple of tickets left. Literally, there's <laughs> yes. like less than five tickets that are Dude. available. We sold out immediately. And then yeah. when COVID came, we did issue a few refunds because a few people were, circumstances mm -hmm. were changing. But we have just a few tickets. They're not even available on the website right now. But if you send us a note, we we, we do have a couple that we could, could get to you. Um, and, and if you're interested in being a speaker, which I guess a couple people watching are, because a lot of people want to be on a TEDx stage, we're get on our mailing list. And you can do that by going to TEDxDupreePark.com, get on our mailing list so that you'll be in our cycle. And next year, when we open it up for our speaker applications, you'll be one of the first to know about it because this year, as Joe Gandolfo said, we had over 200 people <laughs> yeah. that applied to be speakers. So it's really hard to choose. And we narrowed it down to, to a few folks that had a message that we thought would really be important to share from our TEDx Dupree Park stage. And there's a variety of topics, a variety of speakers, some, some that are inspiring and motivational and some that are just going to make you think and, do a double take on life and things that oh. you thought might have been true. And we hope that we help you question that and get into some critical thinking, right? That's that's what we're all about, yes. right, Mike? Critical thought. It's now more than ever, we need to be able to parse and understand what's really going on around us. Um, life does go on. I will say at least our team, the people that we know, um, there's so many people I met, they will not be denied and they will continue on. And that's, to me, the best part of, of the human experience and what we're trying to promote with TEDx2 Free Park. Exactly. Well, with that, Mike, I'm going to send you back backstage and Steve and I'll close things out here. But thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us and being part of TEDx2 Free Park. You betcha. You guys. All right, my friend. Thank so you. Okay, so Steve, um, closing thoughts from today. It was a good show. I enjoyed it. I, you know, I enjoy 
talking. I know them by name from a list. And, you know, and we screened and went through the process. There was a lot. I mean, it was months and months to curate the speakers and then find the coaches. Uh, but now I'm having, and you and I, are, you, you knew them better than me, having the opportunity to meet them. And I'm just, uh, they're just such great people. And that's just part of the whole TED experience. Um, so it's, it's been good. It's been good. It's a kind of a scary world out there, but as long as we keep our heads straight, we lead from our heart and we do something every day in a positive vein, being part of the solution. Uh, we're we're going to get through this even better. And that's not Pollyanna. We really will. And even better. We're seeing it already. Yes, we are. And I'm so grateful that we have this show going on and that we have these amazing, wonderful people in our lives because it keeps me fired up and keeps me excited about the next stage, the next step, what's what's around the corner, what's going to be happening. And I know that with the positive, wonderful people that are in our community and the fact that we're able to amplify their voices, their strong voices, that the world's going to continue to be a better place, that they're going to keep planting seeds of greatness. And we are too. Right. We're, as I said before, we're just building the stages for them to stand on and speak. And everybody does need a stage. And TED is a global stage. So uh, we feel good about that, all of us on this team. Well, as we're going off here today, I do want to, to encourage you, Steve, to do more video and to join <laughs> us in our 30 days 30 videos in 30 days challenge here, uh, not here, but at Video Rockstars, which is, we're one of the sponsors of TEDx Dupree Park as well. And I spoke about it a little bit last week, but we do have 30 videos in 30 days, make a big impact challenge. As Jack was talking about, you guys can get your message out there. Although it'd be nice to have an amazing vide videographer, uh, producer, person who knows all the Hollywood special stuff like Jack on your team, you can do a lot to get your message out into the world. And by learning about video, you can do that. So just join us, videochallengegroup.com. It's free. It's through the, out the month of June. And I'd love to have you guys join us for that. So with that, Steve, we'll see you next week. All right. And thank you so much to the team. Marcy Walsh, back behind the scenes, back there. We're going to get her to come on live one day and say hello. But she's pushing all the right buttons and making sure we know about the different websites to feature up there and all those kind of things. And I want to give a big shout out to Randy Stooks, who is our speaker manager. He has been just such an amazing part of our team. And he's in touch. He's lining up all of our speakers every week, our guests for this show. He's in touch with our speakers and making sure that they're on track with getting their scripts to us and their slides to us. And finding out where to stay and all those kind of things. There are a lot of unsung heroes, but I definitely mm -hmm. want to give a huge shout out to Randy Stukes. He's just been a wonderful part of the team. And thank you so much, Mike Cena, for bringing him into our lives. So with that. All right. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Go see some greatness. Okay. Take care, everybody. <laughs>